Hi, my name is Stuart Williams, and here is another episode of the continuing tour of Azure Platform as a Service features. This time, we're going to talk about Azure SQL. So Azure SQL is a pure platform as a service version of Microsoft's famous SQL Server product. It is, for the most part, uh, SQL 2016, but understanding that SQL Server the product is actually a suite of, for the most part, Windows services and a collection of tools. It's important to know which bits are available platform as a service and which bits are not. So we'll go through this table of each of the features and along the way, I'll have some narrative about each one. SQL Server Reporting Services is not available platform as a service, although if you need it specifically because you have a big catalog of existing reports, you can move the data to Azure SQL and do your reporting, uh, your SSRS reports from a small platform as a service instance because you can install reporting services and for that matter, integration services uh, standalone on a VM. If you're looking to do something more cloudy, we strongly recommend Power BI. Power BI is an amazing and powerful dashboarding, reporting, and visualization tool. It has many uh, interesting analytical features built into it, and it can take input from a variety of data sources and do a lot of uh, mashups and so on. SQL Server Integration Services, as we mentioned, can be used as a standalone on a VM if you have lots of SSIS assets and you want to keep using them. But Azure Logic Apps or Data Factory Apps are the equivalent. Data Factory is a good ETL tool and it has on-ramps and off-ramps for all kinds of different data sources and allows for massive parallelism and the ability to do uh, big data transformations and data movements and is an extremely handy facility. SQL Agent is best done using either the Azure Scheduler or if you're using your SQL Server in an Elastic Pool with Elastic Jobs. We'll get to that in a bit. SQL Mail is absolutely not supported on either infrastructure as a service or platform as a service on the grounds that outbound SMTP and other kinds of messaging are strongly controlled in the Azure environment to avoid Azure becoming a source of evil spam. But there are third-party uh, things in the Azure catalog our favorite being SendGrid, which because it has the ability to expose SMTP like endpoints can be wired together using some of the SQL mail facilities and SendGrid has all of the management and compliance features you could ever ask for. And there are other competitors to SendGrid in the Azure catalog as well. SQL Server Analysis Services is uh, slightly more complicated. Again, you can mount it on a VM as a standalone. I'd use it against any data sources that you would like. But there are a bunch of new and exciting uh, platforms as a service alternatives that do similar sorts of structured data representations. And in fact, we'll probably do a video just on those. But if you're interested, you should look at Azure Analytics Service and Azure SQL Data Warehouse. And of course, our friends Hadoop and the Microsoft implementation HD Insight. And you should also know that many of the things that you might want to do using SSAS are actually doable using just Power BI. So Power BI can do the sorts of time sequence and cubicle type things that you might want to do using SSAS. SQL CLR is absolutely not supported platform as a service. However, those workloads and, in fact, those functions or en enhancements, enrichments to SQL can be done as Azure functions or exposed as web services, which are, of course, callable from SQL stored procedures. 
obviously the premise strategies for scaling, durability, and so on vis-a-vis -vis traditional clustering and backup strategies are different in the cloud, but there are morally equivalent things. And in, in fact, we'll stipulate that it's actually easier to have certain business continuation strategies and backup strategies uh, using Azure Platform as a service as there is uh, using traditional SQL methods. And we'll also point out that the scaling and durability features are much easier to configure and deploy because you simply turn them on up in the cloud. So they're much easier to set up. There is a rich ecosystem of third-party uh, tools and products as well that deal with uh, business continuation, durability, scalability, and so on. And lastly, uh, the T SQL language. You should know that while SQL Server has a lot of backward compatibility features, and in fact, you can set SQL Server databases on the premise to a variety of backward compatibility modes, in platform as a service terms, we strongly recommend that you use the SQL Best Practices Analyzer, which is a free tool, one of the other tools we'll talk about in a bit, and uh, upgrade your uh, schemas and column designs to be the modern equivalents. And you can see a full and rich matrix of comparisons at the URL we provided below. Moving data to Azure SQL. So you should know that for the most part, re-platforming the data, the part that the you know, storage and query engines interoperate on, generally goes pretty seamlessly, especially if you use one of the Microsoft provided migration engines, uh, Data Migration Assistant for SQL Server to Azure SQL, for example, and for uh, non-SQL databases like Oracle and Ingress and so on, you can use the Migration Assistant. And if you use those tools, not only will they tell you about potential difficulties, but they'll also help you upgrade your schemas to their modern equivalents and do the appropriate data transformations and so on. Parenthetically, Azure SQL used to have some pretty constrained size limits. For the most part, those are almost entirely gone. And so you can have some truly impressively sized Azure SQL databases. Azure SQL offers something that premise SQL Server instances don't. And this is that is the concept of an elastic pool. Think of an elastic pool as a defined set of computing, memory, and storage resources. Microsoft measure these as something called a DTU. You can then take your individual SQL instances and group them into pools, and those pools will share the resources. And Microsoft even provides a handy tool that after your individual databases have been running for a while and the tool can see what their resource uses are, what their peak resource uses are, and, and general usage patterns, it will actually recommend uh, how to, to take a collection of SQL Server database instances and put them into a pool, thus achieving some consolidation. Because pools can have upper limits on the number of DTUs, you can have a predictable spend. The uh, pooling mechanism also allows for throttling. And if you want to configure it, it allows you to have automatic scaling. And so as a, uh, a cost control and consolidation tool, it is dandy. And database pools also have elastic jobs, particularly useful for doing certain kinds of schema update tasks, data transformations, or other types of scenarios where you want a script applied to one or more databases in the pool, and if that effort doesn't succeed, those things are rolled back. Generally speaking, we advise that if you own a Azure SQL database, that is a platform as a service database, 
that you put it into a pool for both predictability of cost and to gain uh, scalability. And again, after you've done your migrations and you're running your systems up in the cloud for a while, running that wizard to figure out if you could do some consolidations is great. And those consolidations can be done without stopping access to the database, right? So they can be done dynamically and you can move databases into and out of pools as you need. Security. So fundamentally, all of the security principles available to you in SQL Server on the premise are available to you in the cloud. So you can in encrypt your data at rest. You can bring your own keys if you desire. You can use keys generated by Azure. Strongly recommend that you use Azure Key Vault as your key management mechanism. And likewise, you can encrypt data in motion. And of course, the granular access security, either SQL logins or Active Directory works up in the cloud, as does row-level security, uh, which was a feature introduced in SQL Server 2016 that allows granular access to rows in a table based on user identity works dandy as well. And in terms of controlling what can what can connect to your SQL database instance. There is by default a SQL firewall that denies all external access to the SQL server, but allows uh, access on anything in the same uh, resource group or subnet uh, to the SQL server. Like pretty much everything else in Azure, you can fine tune that by using network security policy and network access rules, and you can read all about that. And you can have auditing and all of the other types of security controls that you might want. One happy note about IP address restrictions is, um, while that is a viable option for securing SQL Server, know that IP addresses can be spoofed and so it's generally wise to have another layer of security protecting your applications, such as one of the network security appliance options available in Azure. Performance. Azure SQL uh, Platform as a Service has pretty much flat performance, which is to say very predictable performance, especially when the SQL Server instance is uh, part of a pool. The platform as a service version, like the premise version, offers suggestions based on its observation of your data access patterns, how to improve the performance in your database, whether that's increasing the number of DTUs, adding missing indexes, foreign key relations, or what have you. Tooling, fundamentally, Azure SQL is SQL Server. So any tooling that works with SQL Server will work with Azure SQL, such as SQL Server Management Studio, which is now a standalone download, which is excellent as the standalone version has its own release cycle, and it's not uncommon to get uh, updates, bug fixes, and new features every couple of weeks. Uh, Visual Studio with data project extensions allows you to uh, have source control of your schema and set up data and so on, and has been working happily for many, many versions and continues to get better and better. It's also important to notice that there are third-party tools like Redgate, Apex, and SQL Hero that offer extensions to Visual Studio and SQL Server Management Studio. And of course, the new Microsoft code uh, has plugins to work against SQL. And so the big takeaway is it's SQL Server that takes away the worry of having to hassle with hardware and servers. The other key takeaway is the business continuation options are truly impressive. Um, you can do data center to data center scaling, zone to zone scaling, and so on. High, the higher you go in the pricing tier, the more high availability and backup options you have. The more times your SQL Server nodes are replicated, the more compute nodes they have, and so on. 
And again, there are plenty of nice third-party solutions and services in the Azure product catalog that add value, uh, including auditing and compliance and so on. That would be part of your business continuation plan. Speaking of auditing and compliance, there are excellent auditing and compliance monitoring tools uh, right out of the box, and those are enhanced by third-party services. And the new Azure monitoring tool has good support for SQL Server instances and uh, will allow you to get an application or system view of the entire system, not just the SQL components, which can be useful in understanding the behavior of your deployed solution up into the cloud. My name is Stuart Williams and I work at Magenta.